but she like woke up feeling awful this morning. So I was like, Leo, you can watch Leo, it back Leo, on the Facebook later. Leo, we're about to go, I believe. Oh, we are live. All right. I was just talking about my girl. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Leah Paulson here with my co-host. My name is Justin Brown. Hi, everybody. Yes, and today we have John Allen with us. We are so excited to have him. Um, he's the CEO of Ivory Ella and built two businesses from scratch before he and friends launched a socially conscious social media retailer in 2015. Ivory Ella highlights the importance of innovation in business as well as corporate philanthropy. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm rocking a little bit of Ivory Ella right now, you know. Uh, so I probably love that. I personally don't <laughs> yeah. own any. All right, just saying. This is my newest. I actually just got it a couple weeks ago. So I've, I've got a bunch of them. I've seen it though. I reckon I recognize the brand. <laughs> that's good because I have a wife. So that's good that I recognize the brand. I don't own any. <laughs> um, so John, can you tell us a little bit more about the mission of Ivoryella and how you and your business partners came up with the concept? Absolutely. Um, so thank you for having me and I'm glad to talk to everybody. So um, I'll step back a little bit and start from the beginning. Um, I started my first business in college um, when I was a sophomore. I actually had a buddy who at the time was making Twitter accounts, and um, he created an account called Lady Boners, which is just pictures of hot guys. Um, I don't know why he started up coming up with that idea, but after about two Clever. weeks, Clever. it had gained you know maybe 100, 150,000 followers, and somebody offered him $30,000 for the account. Uh, freshman in college, $30,000, might as well have been a million. So um, he <laughs> sold it. Uh, and then, you know, kind of a few months later, one day, um, get a call at 2 a.m. John, like, this is it. Like, let's start doing, building these Twitter businesses. It's like, all right, Jacob, you know, you know, wake up in the morning, come talk to me. You know, you're probably drunk now. Um, and we can talk <laughs> about it. So next morning, 8 a.m. bangs on my door and says, hey, you know, I'm serious about this. So we went to the tech center. Um, and we built a business plan around social media and how we were going to build, buy, and sell these kind of parody accounts, which, you know, aren't really a person but have a theme to them on Twitter. Uh, people were doing it at Facebook at the time, and Instagram really wasn't around at the time. So we raised um, $25,000. Actually, my parents gave us our first business loan, and we started buying, selling, and making Twitter accounts. And it was kind of like a snowball effect. Uh, you know, we started with, um, we purchased with that $25,000, about 750, almost a million followers on separate different accounts. We would use those to start different ideas and then use our accounts to grow. So we got, had that snowball. And so we went from a million followers, 3 million, um, to at one point we had just under a hundred million followers across all different accounts. Um, but as we were doing that, we were doing ads for anybody we could find, um, you know, Google, um, Disney, Coca-Cola, Pixar, um, basically anybody that we could sell impressions and ads to, we would um, sell them to. And then one day kind of said, you know, if people are paying us to promote their stuff, what do they make on the back end? Why don't we just promote our own stuff? And so my junior year of college, we created our first store called Boho Outfitters, which was this bohemian jewelry style company. Again, we were really just wholesaling stuff from China and doubling the price and um, you know, shipping it out of my college dorm room, but we were making about thirty to sixty thousand dollars a month. And so, junior in college, um, literally just sitting on my couch tweeting, uh, it's like, "All right, great, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life." And so, um, we started coming up with different concepts for stores. While we were doing that, we noticed this trend on social media with elephants. I mean, anytime we posted something with an elephant, especially a baby elephant, we would see seven to thirteen times the engagement. Um, the retweets, people were just in love with elephants. At the same time, HBO released a documentary called An Apology um, to Elephants about the Ringley Brothers in the circus um, and kind of how elephants were treated there. So it was really this storm um, brewing up of kind of demand for elephants. So we decided to build our brand around elephants. Uh, and again, at the time we were running Boho and our mindset was we're just going to make 10 of these little kind of pop-up stores. So develop the logo, develop the name, um, and actually, three days before, a buddy of mine who is you know, now a partner of ours at Ivory Ellen uh, works for us, kind of said, you know, John, do you think it's right to sell this stuff you know, for an endangered species? And we're like, eh, that's a good point. So we did just kind of what any other college kid does, and Googled how to save the elephants. The first thing that came up was savetheelephants.org. 
we called them and said, Hey, we have this t-shirt idea. You know, they're like, well, we don't really do sponsorships. We've gotten you know, trouble. We're like, listen, if we write you a check. Will you take it? And they're like, sure, absolutely. So we went on our way. We built 500 shirts and we kind of said, you know, if we sell these on the first month, amazing. The first week, you know, life changing. Um, we launched April 18th, 2015 at midnight. It was a Friday at midnight. I was actually at a buddy's, um, house at bloomsburg university for a block party and we sold out in 17 minutes really no apparel experience um whatsoever got on the phone with my other partners and we kind of said you know just put it on pre-sale set see how many we could sell and you know we'll figure it out from there um so by the time sunday it came we had done just over six hundred thousand dollars in sales we had none of the product or any idea what we were going to do my one partner matt was a high school teacher at the time um, we had met through social media. He was building these followings um, like me and my buddy in college were. And so um, we decided to kind of join up with him and two other people before we launched Ibriella to, again, have this really big free marketing channel. And so we had never met in person. We had met really once. And um, he calls me because I was doing all the film at Boho and goes, John, I don't even know how to turn on the printer. I have to go to work tomorrow. What are we going to do? I said, man, I'm in college. I got nothing better to do. Like, I'll come up, help you. So I went up to Connecticut that Sunday um, and really never moved back. The worst we got was we were about 30,000 orders back ordered. A thousand of those were over a hundred days old. We had contacted all the customers. They didn't want a refund. Um, they just wanted their shirt. So uh, we really knew we had something special. Um, about seven months in, I actually um, fell asleep at the wheel. You know, we were working about um, 20 to 22 hours every day, seven days a week. And you get to a point where you're, you know, you get to about three days in of really no sleep and your body starts running off adrenaline and it's actually hard to sleep. Um, and so I kind of had that, you know, where I felt perfectly fine. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was going about 80 on the highway and just woke up spinning in flames, walked out totally okay. Um, but really, you know, took a step back. I'm a big mama's boy, you know, my mom kind of came up and said, all right, this, you know, lifestyle is not going to work out. You may be making good money, but it's going to kill you. So um, we really, for the first time in our business, started thinking smarter and not harder. And so we brought in some consultants with experience who built out an entire fulfillment facility for us. We built out an entire print shop, um, again, to really work smarter, not harder. And so, um, you know, we kind of call those first seven months just the dark times because it's almost hard to even remember sometimes things were moving so fast. Um, but so those, you know, first seven months were kind of super chaotic. And then over the next two years, we really grew. So we moved about seven times in our first 13 months, um, which is a nightmare. I hate moving. I never want to do it again, but now we're in a 60,000 square foot warehouse. We do all of our own printing and fulfillment. Um, so, you know, on any given day, we can easily print 10,000 t-shirts, Black Friday comes around, you know, we fill over 30 to 50,000 packages a day. So um, we really have been out quite a nice operation. Um, so that was super quick, super high level. Um, you know, how I real started and got in, obviously there's a lot of stuff down the way. And so, you know, happy to talk about things um, that you guys you know, think would be more relatable. I can go into deeper um, stuff with the charity component, whatever, you know, makes sense for you. I can talk about this for days. So I want to make the, you know, the time most useful for you guys. So whatever you think's best, but that's my you know five minute elevator pitch. Wow. Dang. I didn't know a lot of that beginnings and stuff. I knew that you had started kind of with like the idea and stuff and you were at Temple, right? Like when you yeah, like, started I was, your first couple. So I was, a. Uh, I was at Temple and it was actually my senior year when we started. And so when I went up to Connecticut, we were still in classes. And again, I moved up there and I never went back. So I was taking three classes at the time and I kind of sent my teacher's note. I'm like, listen, this is a once in a lifetime op opportunity. I mean, every time I refreshed my phone, I had made a thousand dollars. It was unbelievable. Um, so I was like, I'm not coming back. I'm sorry. Like, and they're like, it's all right. Like, you're absolutely right. This is a great opportunity. And Honestly, all three teachers gave me a C minus, and so I was able to graduate. Um, so I, I did actually graduate, which was nice. Um, my mom was pretty happy about that. John is telling but, us you need to get degrees, but that's not what we're pushing. <laughs> but John, you had to take it, man. I, like, yeah, I, and, uh, I mean, like I said, I, my buddies around me at the time, and I, I'm kind of freaking out. You know, we're at a, a house party. It's not even my buddy's house. I'm like kicking people out, turn off the music. Everybody's like, what? I'm like, guys, I just made 60 grand in 10 minutes. Like everybody's be quiet for a second. I have no idea what's going on right now. You know, 
Um, I'm trying to figure out if it's a scam, if this is real life, what's happening. And so, um, you know, it was absolutely crazy. But, you know, two weeks later, we called back, saved the elephants and sent them a check for $50,000. And they're like, uh, are you the kids that called us a few weeks ago about the t-shirts? We're like, yeah, it worked. And they're like, so they flew us out to California. We were able to meet with them um, and the World Wildlife Foundation. And that really became a big part of what we do is giving back. And so um, a year and a half in, I was actually able to make my first trip to Samburu, Kenya. Um, we were there for just over a week and a half. Um, and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Uh, there was one day where basically what we kind of believe in is, you know, save the elephants. It's their job to really save the elephants. It's not our job to tell them where to use the money. You know, we obviously make sure corporate overhead and things like that um, are following nonprofit rules. But for the most part, we give them a, a check and say, do what you want with it. Um, we feel that's the best way to help out our charity partners is by letting them make the decisions. It's the reason we picked them as a partner because they make those decisions the right way. Um, and so we went and saw where some of our money was being spent. And there was a school just outside um, the National Reserve where we had built a fence for the school, um, which doesn't seem like a lot. It was, you know, 10 grand, something that we do before 10 a.m. most days. And we get there and there is just this line of people you know paving the roads clapping and singing for us and it was this huge celebration um you know the girls hadn't been able to go to school for several years because they were being kidnapped or wildlife and so this huge fence we had built had allowed um girls to go to school for the first time in years there and for the community it was amazing and so um again it was one of the most amazing days in my life um it really you know that's where i think kind of giving back and corporate responsibility really started to you know, hit and resonate with me again. We didn't start this to be a, a nonprofit. We did start it to make money. Um, we didn't necessarily start it to save the elephants, but now, you know, absolutely, it's a huge part of what I do. We've been able to donate just over two million dollars um, to save the elephants and some other um, partners. We do a lot with the Boston's Children Ho Children's Hospital, um, along with childhood cancer. We have a, a girl, Megan Bug, um, who actually has childhood cancer. It's a big spokesperson for it, who partners with us every year we've been able to donate a couple hundred thousand for that as well. Um, so again, where we started is just elephants. We've kind of grown into that truly, um, you know, good clothing for a good cause, our, core, you know, our company logo, because that is kind of what we mean and what we want to do by everything we sell. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, Justin, were you going to say something? I was yeah, gonna... I was going to ask, like, it seems like you took two two directions to get here because you didn't know that this effect was going to affect this which led you to this path that you're on now so like where's the next step or where is this maybe potentially leading you to maybe another big project that's about to about to come up anything anything like that yeah so it's actually interesting so um while i'm, I'm still involved with ibriel i'm actually um involved in another company as well um called alta gracia so um, i'm actually currently in our office here down in atlanta now and so what Alta Gracia is, is we're uh, an apparel manufacturer uh, based out of the Dominican Republic, but we're the only certified living wage apparel company in the world. And so we pay all of our employees three and a half times minimum wage, um, full family, uh, health care and benefits, along with several other things. And so for me, it's been really cool to kind of take what I've learned from the apparel side um, and the give back and, you know, work on something new that's a little bit more on the human side. Right. Um, it's been crazy to kind of go down to our factory in the DR where, um, you know, we have over 100 people employed um, and see just how much of a change, you know, we've been able to give them and the community. I mean, you can see very clearly the employees that work at Alta Gracia first, the people that don't, you know, people that are making, honestly, living in sweatshops, making shirts for a couple of cents versus our employees who, you know, make a few bucks every hour with again, goes a long way down there. And so um, that's kind of been my newest big project. It's been a lot of fun. We do all collegiate apparel. So we sell to over 800 different colleges across the United States um, and do licensed stuff. So it's been a, it's been a fun journey. And that's kind of, you know, been the way I, I've gone down again. I, I had no apparel or definitely manufacturing experience going into this. I've, I've obviously had to learn a lot quick. Um, and so again, for me, I, I think in everything I do going forward, I want to have it some Point, you know, some charitable give back. Again, what we're doing with Alta Grassi is a little different. It's not necessarily a, a charitable give back, um, but we are really building communities down there, which is great. Um, 
a few of our employees, we have over eight employees who have actually left to start their own business from funding they've made from the company, um, which is so cool to see and do to kind of see communities change like that. So, yeah. Do you sell any apparel? What's just university? I mean, that's what I'm rocking right now. Do we, do we, I, I do. I do believe we are in the Westchester bookstore. So oh, go check it out. Nice. Look for that Alta Gracia yeah. um, nice. clothing. So, and again, it's been cool for me to see um, just from, you know, the financial side, how much we can make a t-shirt for. Right. And then you go look at somebody like a Gil Dan um, or Jardines, somebody that is, you know, pretty much known for running sweatshops to make sure it's the cheapest cost. And like ours is like seven cents more, you know, um, so it really has no effect. And I think that's something that's so misconstrued out um, in the market, in the media right now is again, you don't really need to have a sweatshop to make money, make an apparel. Again, we pay all our people three and a half times, just a minimum wage. And again, it's like a six to seven cent difference from just your standard run of the mill sweatshop tea. So it's been kind of cool for me. No, that's so cool. I'm like, so not business minded because I'm in residence life here. So like, I'm learning so much from you right now. I'm fascinated. So <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, so we have a couple questions. So Joyce has a question for you. So Joyce, if you want to unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask. Hi, Mr. Allen. My name is Joyce Romero. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, I love Iriella. I had it a bunch in like high school. Um, I'm currently a junior uh, marketing and international business major at Westchester University. So my question was just uh, kind of like regarding your marketing strategy before like you even launched your product. What do you think helped you um, get so many people to want to buy the product within the time span it did sell out? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think there are a few things to go into it. One, social media, um, you know, I guess it was about five, so before almost six years ago was a different place, right? Um, nowadays, it's really hard I mean, you cannot get out there to millions of people like, you know, virally for free. You know, Facebook is king and they basically now they own Instagram. They don't really let you go viral without paying. We didn't really have that problem back then. Right. So things naturally went viral, you know, back then, whereas they don't now. So we had a ton of followers, obviously, across different accounts. So we had a platform to reach people now, probably about two to three weeks before we launched there was this thing on Twitter going around. It was called like the starter pack. You know, it was like four pictures of, like, and right. And you group people really basically by this. Right. So we did things like that generic tweets where it would be like, again, like, you know, the basic white girl starter pack and it had like the Starbucks, like a pair of cut jeans, Converse, and then this ivory yellow shirt, which we wouldn't tell anybody what it was, but we started associating it with other really big brands and kind of creative ways like that. And so we generated this kind of organic buzz about it. We also built um, a Twitter page called Baby Elephants, which had over 600,000 followers. And the night we launched, we just changed that into our company account. So we had all these people. Wow. That loved, we had all these people that loved elephants um, already on a page. And then we sold them elephant products combined with, again, we had kind of subliminally put it with other you know, really well-known brands, really high-end brands. So people saw it, they had questions kind of what it was, and they already had that preconceived notion that, you know, this was a popular brand. Wow. That's brilliant. Wow. Dang. You made that baby elephant account and then just switched up on them. <laughs> that was so smart. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was a lot of luck. So like I could sit here and pretend like I'm the smartest marketer in the world, right? <laughs> there are people that did it before us. You know, we did it with Boho and again, you know, we were making thirty, sixty thousand dollars. You know, whereas, um, you know, last year we did almost thirty million with Ivoriella, right? So it's obviously a little different. We we did hit almost lightning in a bottle. Um, so again, there was definitely a strategy component to it. Ninety percent of it was just pure luck. So, so how? Sorry, I have another question. Just kind of bouncing off of that. Um, how does your marketing strategy back then compare to what it is now? So again, it's way different now. Um, everything is paid in some way, right? There are obviously um, different growth hacks you can do and every once in a while somebody figures it out. So um, I don't know if you guys are familiar. It was probably three years ago. Um, it's a company called Sunny Co Bathing Suits did the red swimsuit on Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. um, I actually know the guy very well. It's, to me, that is like an example of genius viral marketing where he found a way to basically get everybody to post for him. 
and he sold over a million swimsuits on the first day. Now, he didn't have any swimsuits, so he was in a worse position than me. Um, and he had gotten to a little bit of trouble with it, but he figured it out, and now is a company from it. So every once in a while, right, somebody does have that genius marketing idea. Unfortunately, so much of online social is owned by, again, Facebook, which is king. And Facebook's really good at knowing that if you're making money, we're going to make money. And so they definitely limit you and you have to, you know, you have to pay to play kind of. So again, we were free marketing almost the first year. We had like zero marketing dollars on our um, P&L because it was all of our platform. It was free. Now, again, it's almost 20% of our revenue is online marketing spend. Um, we're all over TikTok now. Again, obviously, as these new socials come up, there's always a window where for the social platform, content is, you know, king it's what runs the platform until they get big enough where they can monetize off it so whenever we see those new platforms pop up we try and capitalize as much as we can on it because there's not as much restrictions um but again even now by far our highest generating platform is facebook um because they have so much data their algorithms are so good so even though we have to pay for it you know we do still do you know really well returns on it and get back from it um, but it's just been that difference of balancing, again, kind of paid versus free. We could do a lot of free testing back then. Now and then we have to be a little bit more strategic with our campaigns to see the results we want to get. Well, we can't just willy-nilly throw something out there because we don't necessarily know the results we're going to get. Um, we still do do similar things. So our most popular shirt, if you're familiar with the brand at all, we have this tie-dye ombre, and it's red up top and blue at the bottom. The first time we posted that, we posted on Instagram, we just got ripped to shreds. I mean, every other comment was like, this is the ugliest thing in the world. Who would ever buy this? And we're like, literally after like two minutes, there was like 15,000 comments of how ridiculous this shirt is. And we're like, okay, let's take this down. We took new pictures and put it back up like 20 minutes later. And the only difference was we rolled the sleeves up on the picture and we sold probably 5,000 in three minutes. So... Um, we still try and do some of those little tests. It, it is crazy what things work and don't. And we, we are really big on kind of um, A and B testing. So, you know, go to our homepage. If we have this is the title, how many people click it versus if we have this, you know, individual words that we have, even, you know, do we use shirt or T-shirt? We do that stuff just all day, every day, which we've always done. Um, we've always done different testing that way. Again, how we drive the traffic has definitely changed a lot. But some of those basic kind of marketing tests and um, data that we're looking for still remains the same. Thank you. I just want to note, I'm pretty sure I have one of those shirts and I definitely thought it was cute from the beginning. So <laughs> well, I say, I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> I, I tell everybody we brought back tie dye. And then if anybody has a pop socket on their phone or knows what a pop socket is, um, it was uh, my ex-girlfriend at the time had a friend up for the weekend. My girlfriend at the time was working for me. Her friend was up and was like, yeah, look at this new company that, you know, my cousin's involved with. And it was PopSocket. They're based in North Carolina. And we're like, these are so cool. So we called them up and we were actually the only ones that were allowed to sell PopSocket for like the first three months. So we sold, I mean, we had to have sold half a million PopSockets before like Again, we blew them up on social media, and then they came to us and were like, listen, guys, we're not going to give you exclusive rights anymore. Like, Target wants to buy us, and we're like, yeah, dude, we totally get it. Like, <laughs> so I tell everybody, we brought back uh, tie-dye, we made pop sockets what they are. What? That's, That's so cool. crazy. <laughs> I wasn't even aware, like, branding-wise, that if you just so happen to go viral, that you have to pay Facebook to allow it to happen? They, you, yeah, you won't, I mean... Every once in a while, like, you know, so I tell, I use the example of um, Drake um, had that song where everybody was getting out of the car, right, and doing the little dance thing. Mm -hmm. So what people don't realize is before that song came out, Drake paid people like, like my, like my Do You Love Me song. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Drake paid like people like me, other influencers across all platforms to pre do this dance and stuff. So he released the song. Then he released his Instagram of doing the thing. And then everybody else immediately released it at the same time. And so then people started copying along, right? Song went to the billboard number one and it totally worked for him. But everybody thought it was this like organic dance. Like uh, Drake paid about a million bucks to get people to do that. And then it took off, right? So um, it's really, it 
always be skeptical of what you see on the internet. For the most part, if something's <laughs> going viral, there is an absolute monetary reason for it. Again, every once in a while, those things slip through. And now, especially with TikTok, um, you know, more is getting through because it's a new platform, but it's already tightening up pretty quick. But for the most part, if you're seeing something on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, like go viral, somebody's paid for it to be there 100%. Wow. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. So obviously you're pretty like well-rounded in the business area with like entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, uh, marketing. Was there any time like during your college years that you thought you might be taking a different path, whether in a different area of business or like a different area altogether? Yeah, I was going to be a, a lawyer until Ariella started. So even when, again, we had um, Boho going, I was um, interning at a law firm and I was actually valley parking. So um, I was kind of doing the three of those. Now, I had a bunch of help. My sister was doing all of our customer support emails. Um, my roommates were working for me doing Twitter and stuff. So I had more free time to have a few other jobs. But yeah, I was studying for the LSATs and I was going to be a lawyer. Um prior to Iriella, not sure if it's because I wanted to, or if it's just like, I had to have a plan to tell my parents, like <laughs> they paid for my college. So I have to come out of here with something. Um, <laughs> so uh, I definitely was looking at more of a kind of structural career path. But uh, again, once I got involved with social media um, and we started doing stuff, I always knew I would do at least something on the side. You know, I'd find a way to try and make an extra 40, 50 grand a year just on a side hustle. Um, but now I was going to be, like I said, a, a lawyer until uh, until Ibriella had started. Dang, that's crazy. You just never yeah. know like when it, your path is going to change because we have, well, in a lot of universities, it's undecided, but here we call it exploratory studies. Um, but even like our uh, students who declare majors and it's like, you know, across universities in the country, like people will change three, four times, like figuring out what they want to do. And people like don't know how to feel about that, but you just have to move wherever, you know, you feel like you're needed at the time. So for you, it felt like law at first, but now here you are. So. Yeah, I said I came into school even before that wanting to do, you know, like television and news and producing stuff like that. So, I mean, I probably changed my mind three or four times throughout <laughs> college. I feel like everybody does if you don't, yeah. you know. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a, a one another question for you. So I know you've traveled, you mentioned Kenya and the Dominican Republic. What are some of the other like awesome experiences Ivriella and your current business like have afforded you, whether it's like to travel or just something memorable or um, rewarding? Yeah, I mean, I've been extremely fortunate uh, to be able to travel a lot. I, I've lived in a lot of different places. I mean, I've moved probably myself eight or nine times over the last five years. Uh, I'm in Atlanta now. I'm actually moving to Raleigh, North Carolina next week. Um, lived in Boston and New York for a little bit. Philly obviously is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, so I have had the opportunity to move everywhere. And I think, you know, for me, I would say probably until my sophomore year of college, I was like the typical, like, why would I ever leave the United States? Like it's the greatest place in the world, right? Like everything else is going to be, you know, a step worse. And so my sophomore year, I visited my buddies in Barcelona um, who were studying abroad and it totally changed my life. And I was like, this is the most amazing thing ever. Other cultures, how people experience the world, how they think differently. And so I've always loved to travel. I mean, I probably travel at least somewhere once a month, once every two months, um, whenever I can. So, uh, you know, that's not a great story for you. Again, that day in Kenya was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, but I mean, I, I have been able to kind of be everywhere, which is nice. I, again, the United States, um, Europe, um, a little bit in Asia. So I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to kind of go everywhere. Um, you know, I, another good story, when we were in Kenya the one night, um, I was laying out by the river because, I mean, the stars are just, there's just no light over there. We were staying in um, the Samburu Wildlife Reserve, I believe. Um, and so th there was just no light, nothing. So, I mean, I, w I could stare at the stars for just hours at a time. I mean, you'd see a shooting star every five, six seconds. And so um, I fell asleep there. And next, like, a few hours later, like, the guards, like, wake me up. Everybody's yelling at me all mad. I'm like, what the hell's the big deal? Like, two days later, they bring me back out to where I was sleeping. And there were these jaguar balls that were, like, the size of my hand. 
And they're like, this is why you cannot go off alone. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, okay. John, John was Tiger King. He was Tiger <laughs> yeah, King. Exactly. So no, John, I, did you watch it? Did you watch Tiger King? I did. So See, Leah, come Refused. on. Leah. I can't. Come on, Leah. <laughs> you can't seen either. It? No. Can't stand it. John, we actually have a question from Patricia. So we're going to allow her to ask her question to you. Absolutely. Okay. Hi, John. Uh, my name is Patty Diggin, and I'm the director of the Entrepreneurship Center here at Westchester University, the Cottrell Center. So I was so pleased that Leah reached out to me to try to promote today um, because you epitomize every I I bring guest speakers uh, to campus all the time. And I'm hoping I can get you in the fall for because we're going to be back. I hope um, I really would love to have you come and especially we have a global entrepreneurship week that we celebrate. Uh, it's the last full week before Thanksgiving every year. I bring a lot of speakers to campus then and your messaging is so important to our students. And so my question was, um, how do I when I'm working with students that are building out their business ideas uh, or they want to start businesses or they are starting business, a lot of them come to a lot of them do come to me particularly wanting to do something in the retail space of developing a product to market or a cosmetic line or whatever. How do I inspire them um, to incorporate CSR in their overall business strategy? I also teach the business course, Business in Society, which is hinged around corporate social responsibility. So I'm really in that track, if you will. And I'm trying to get students to have understand social impact as what you can be, as you've proven, you can be a for-profit business that's still doing good. You don't have to just be a nonprofit to help out others in the world. Absolutely. And it's just, you know, obviously I would love to come. So Westchester, uh, I'm from media. So <laughs> Westchester is obviously uh, close to me. Cool. Uh, like like I said, um, for all to Gracia, <laughs> we do business with you guys. So it gives me a good reason to come anyway, too, for <laughs> business. Um, but so, you know, I'll, I'll take that question kind of a couple of ways. First, from just a, a strictly business and number standpoint, it makes sense. That's what we found. Um, so for me, I'm a very, I'm a very data analytics guy. I mean, I've been selling primarily women's clothes since I was, um, you know, 18 years old. There's a reason for that, right? More women buy online. Um, so I have, and there's more women online. So that's why we chose to start with Boho. That's how, again, we got into Ariel. While it is unisex, you know, it's 90% female. Um, and so I look at everything from a number standpoint. What we found for us, um, our 10% um, that we donate to Save the Elephants isn't necessarily a traffic driver. It was in the beginning, but not as much so now because it's become more common. But what it does is it really helps our aban abandoned cart rate and conversion rate. And so what we find is that people who either add to cart or when they get to checkout, we still charge $7.49 for shipping, um, which in Amazon's world is almost unheard of. And the reason we can do that, to be honest, is because there is a little bit of a guilt when people get to that cart that now they know they're making a difference. They don't want to take it out. So from strictly a business perspective, I am a true believer of it works. I've seen the numbers. I've worked with other companies that have, again, implemented it. Uh, not to drive traffic, but rather to take the traffic they already have and, again, increase those conversion rates, that abandoned cart rate. So that'd be the first way to say, it. again, for me, the second piece, I just think that's the way the world is going. Um, even before the madness of Corona, which I think is going to add to it, we saw a pretty big trend in just CSR and businesses because consumers were really looking for it over the last few years. Um, it kind of became a thing of not a differentiator, but if you don't have it, you know, we're not even going to shop here kind of thing. We're not going to shop here because you have it, but you're immediately off the list if you don't have it, if that makes sense. And so it has become a more industry-wide thing, especially in apparel. Um, it's just a common practice now. So from, you know, that kind of standpoint, again, I, I think it makes sense just because of the business results you see from it. Obviously, if you can combine that with something that you're passionate for, um, and want to do, it's even better. You know, one of the big things, um, Save the Elephants, and we kind of let them do the speaking for us on it, is we're by far their number one biggest corporate donor. And so they encourage other people. They don't necessarily want nonprofits. Um, again, awareness isn't the biggest thing for them. They know how to use the money better. So companies that are able to use profits to put it back into the business to grow business means bigger donations for them. 
And so they actually have, because of us, encouraged people to adopt a similar business model to us. Hey, don't start a nonprofit. Try and start a profitable company where you're going to, you know, cut out X number of donate, you know, piece for donations, and then you're going to use that other part to grow your company. Because the bigger the company you are, um, obviously the bigger the donations are. There are just so many restrictions with nonprofits, and for good reasons that it limits growth. Mm-hmm. And so, um, especially if you're an entrepreneur and wanting to start a business, growth is everything. And so, um, if you're able to now help your cause that you want to support while growing a business, which helps you, it's kind of a win-win for everybody. Um, so again, for me, I haven't at least found reasons not to do it. Uh, again, because for us, the ten percent, you know, we donate. I mean, that's just, again, I can look at that in a conversion rate number and know that we would lose X number of dollars if we didn't do it. And I can tell you it's much greater than the 10%. Mm-hmm. Great, great, great response. So it's so good because you had the business side with the, you know, with the practicality side. And, and it's interesting too, because yesterday, I don't want to bore everybody on here, but I was talking with the gentleman and he's, would or Wednesday, and he um, definitely... He's been involved with Wall Street for 50 years. <clears throat> but he said at the end of our conversation, he said, um, and I want you to know that I definitely believe in free market um, business. So he's, I said, oh, are you Milton Friedman? And he's like, yep. So those of you, I hope all of you, if you're not business majors, you're probably like, what is she talking about? But you better know what that is, Joyce. <laughs> so um, I said, because I'm not, you know, I'm more of the Bill Gates. I said, so I just kind of dropped it. I went like, okay, you know. <laughs> But uh, you're definitely in the Bill Gates lane of, you know, because he's the same way of there's so much you can do out there if you just think about it. Like you can serve underserved populations and be making a living. You know, there's just so much, so much you can do if you just put your mind to it and don't yeah. just think about the profits, you know. Yeah, and again, the bottom line. You know, we, um, so for Alta Gracia, which we had now, we do take a business perspective of it. You know, earlier in the year, we did have to do layoffs at our factory to make it more efficient. But now we've hit our efficiency numbers um, and we're actually rehiring people again. So we kind of, originally the business was run. Um, Alter Grass has been around for actually almost 10 years. And so um, myself and other gentlemen came in and purchased it over, over a year ago. What is the name? Can you spell that for me again? A-L-T-A-G-R-A-C-I-A, Alta Gracia. Oh, gracia. Uh huh. So, you know, what we did is we kind of went back and we did build it as a business for the right reasons. And again, in our research, we found out that we can pay people more money and still get the same kind of product and result. And actually, we found that our product quality is even a little bit better because our employees <laughs> care more. Um, and so we, you know, it made a ton of sense for us as a business to, again, dial back a little bit. But then as we shared that message, as we've grown a little bit, we've been able to do even more than we originally started with. Um, and so it's been, you know, I do think you don't have to have a, you know, only business mindset and then, you know, only charity. There is a, a good middle ground, which again, for the most part, almost everybody can and probably should be doing. I am, I am a believer of that, um, that in some way we all have to do our part a little bit. But uh, again, there are plenty of business reasons to do it as well to make that bottom line number bigger. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Are you recording this Leah? Yeah, we actually are going to have it. So you can watch it back on our uh, Facebook if you would like to. Awesome. Yeah. And Patricia, we've met before. We've met before as well. Hi Justin. I do remember. I think we met in the the Sykes or something at one of those. (laughs) We did. We did. (laughs) Your office does great things. Uh, again, this program is brought to you by the Office of Residence Life and Housing Services as part of our speaker series. John Allen, everybody. John, how can people follow you? Like, if what are your social media handles? Like, if I wanted to jump on here right now and continue to see all the wonderful things you're doing. So I actually did go a little bit away from social media for a little bit. So um, we're in the middle of making masks at our factory right now. And okay. so obviously, uh, again, for Alta Gracia, which is, Again, for the most part, been my main focus um, for the last few months here. Uh, all of our business is college apparel. Well, colleges aren't open right now, and um, people are talking about them not being open in fall. So we've had to make a pivot. Again, having a uh, manufacturer, we're fortunate the most is we are able to make a smooth pivot. So we've started producing masks uh, as recently as this week. So I've been kind of um, almost.
almost like if you're a sports guy, LeBron dark mode in the playoffs. Like, so I'm kind of off social media. I have Twitter still. That's about it. Twitter and Facebook. Um, my okay. Twitter's at postage, um, like the stamp and then my Facebook, <laughs> but honestly, my email is just John J O H N at Ibriella.com. Um, my cell phones, you know, Leah has my cell phone. You can give it to anybody. You can post on this. I don't care. I love when people reach out to me, to be honest. I honestly encourage more people to do it. Um, I love meeting people. I love having discussions. You know, um, I'm a big believer of, um, you know, I don't know everything. I actually don't know a lot. And so I can learn something from almost everybody that reaches out to me. Mm-hmm. I hope I can share something with somebody. So, um, Again, feel free to post my email, my phone number. I love it when people reach out to me. I love talking about this. I love thinking about things differently. Um, and so, again, that's probably the easiest way to reach me is, again, email or phone. Um, if you do find me on social, I'm pretty much not active on it right now. Like I said, I'm kind of an all-hands-on-deck mode. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, when you come on campus, we're going to make it like a huge, huge thing. So just know that that's coming. Uh, I, don't, I don't do small crowds, Justin. I sell no. out. <laughs> Uh, right, 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 right. Absolutely. I had my women's entrepreneurship conference in November. We sold out at the foundation. So yeah. Nice, nice, nice. I like nice. sellout crowds. Oh, I, oh, I do. I think well. he deserves the um, Asplund Theater, I think. I think so as well. Yes. We can make it happen. We can make it happen. <laughs> so John, what we've been doing at the end of every one of our sessions is we've just allowed the speaker to take us out. You can give words of wisdom. You can give a funny story. You could say the meaning of life, whatever you want to. We just don't give you time to plan for it. So right. here you go. You're on. Give it to us. Cool. Well, I think um, something that somebody, you know, told me and resonated to me the other day, which I think is super important um, in kind of the current social climate and just the world environment right now with coronavirus and everything that's going on. This has been such a unique experience in everybody's life. Um, I really don't think there's anybody who's gone through something like this. And so this is a moment in time where you're going to remember things probably greater than you do for other memories of your life. You'll remember where you were, the conversations you had, the things you did because of how unique and different this is. And so for me, I really took that to heart because, you know, what am I doing every day that I'm going to want to remember for the rest of my life? Because I'm going to remember more now than I would about any other experience or event in my life. Um, And so, you know, I'm a big podcast guy, but I've been trying to get a little bit more back into books, um, into reading again, trying to, you know, take that in. Um, I've been trying to, again, get to a better routine of working out early in the morning, trying to find new businesses to get involved with. Uh, Because again, this is, while it is such a crazy time, um, it's such a different time in our lives that again, we're going to remember things. And so for me, at least, I would like to remember um, myself getting better and helping make the world a little bit better during that time. But I I do think everybody should kind of think about that. You know, what are you going to do um, that you're going to remember for your rest of your life. Cause there are a lot of people who are going to remember just kind of being in their house and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, a lot of people are spending more time with their family. Um, but for me, at least I would like to remember how I used this time to grow, um, and became a kind of a better person. So, um, I'll, you know, I was left with that the other day, so I'll leave you guys with that. Absolutely. John, Alan, everybody, John, we're about to make some quick announcements. Feel free to stay on. And if you want to be a part of these, John, let us know. We will definitely put you on. Here are our programs for next week. We got Jessica Pimentel from Orange is the New Black. Bill Burr, obviously, you know him from Breaking Bad. I know him from The Chappelle Show. Um, He's a comedian. He's going to be with us. Uh, Salish, the hypnotist. Uh, Mike Johnson. Go ahead, Leah. You can tell us a little bit about him. Should have been The Bachelor 2020, um, but he <laughs> was on the last uh, season of The Bachelorette. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Leah Delaria, Orange is the New Black. She played Boo. Meryl Reese, um, the voice of Philadelphia. Um, you should know who he is, John. You should be on for that. This is a legend. We're excited for him. Um, we have a like Nickelodeon um, game show host day. We're going to have Mark Summers from Double Dare, Kirk Fogg from Legends of the Hidden Temple, Phil Moore from Nick Arcade, and Summer Sanders from figure it out and then on thursday who we got leah that is another bachelor couple jared and ashley they're pretty pretty famous in the bachelor world <laughs> that's what people are telling me because i'm asking you know I'm trying they really to are those are filling up leah. already they're excited to... about it Just, like are you said, not they're... on the bachelor game no, no man you're missing out on great tv can man you're missing can out I, can I just be honest i didn't even know there were any people of color on the bachelor 
Well, to be school. honest, there aren't a ton to be truly, yeah. So when this happens, I'm just kind of like, meh, and kind of like turn channel, you know, and I'm not a bachelor, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and the last three we have is Kyla uh, Lacey. She's spoken word. She's going to hit us with some cool stuff. Claudia Jordan, you've probably seen her everywhere, Real Housewives of Atlanta. Uh, she was on Deal or No Deal. She was also on a couple seasons of The Apprentice with our president. And um, last but not least, we had a late submission today. Um, and I'm going to butcher his last name. We need to make sure we figure this out. Um, formerly known as Timothy De La Ghetto. His name is now, uh, I guess his formal name, Timothy Chantaragonzo. I think it's Chantaransu, but... Ch Chantaransu. See, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll get this together. And he confirmed with us today. So we'll have to leave have him with us next Friday. So we got a big lineup. Now, we can't even spill stuff about the following week, but the following week, man, whoo, some big names that week. So we wow. hope that you all join us, uh, Residence Life Speaker Series. We will see you there. And I hope everybody has a great weekend. Uh, Mark uh, Sipka at four o'clock, uh, comedian. <laughs> so join us then and we'll see.